two, three, four. Okay, not many. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Uh, we've got uh, five speakers, so we have, um, I believe, six minutes per each speaker. And uh, after that, we'll have the discussion uh, with the audience, both online and uh, on site. I'll, I, uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, we will have any outcome of this uh, session. Either you will uh, support your first opinion or you will change it. Never mind, it doesn't matter. The idea is to discuss. So, some experts consider that uh, Metaverse is the first step towards the digital state uh, and uh, the corresponding citizenship, let's say digital citizenship. And as a product of uh, Web 3.0, the Metaverse will in fact uh, reduce the role of the state. That means that uh, IT giants and corporations are establishing rules in the metaverses and governments, vice versa, have uh, very little uh, power inside uh, virtual worlds uh, because of the absence of uh, any rules and regulations. Uh, the widespread use of decentralized applications in any area of society with the, within the country actually takes the area out of national legislation. Oh, that's better. Thank you. Well, having said that, I'd like to give the floor to our first speaker, Ms. Alona Yudina. Alona, please. Hello. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to the session. That we have some technical and for the question, do you hear me issues? well? Hello. Do you hear me well? Hello. Never mind, sometimes it happens. Hmm. Um, I, yeah, I don't know what to do. Do you hear me? All Hello. Right. Uh, we can uh, skip to the next speaker. Uh, I'd like to give the floor to Milos. And uh, before I do that, uh, I'll have uh, to make a short, let's say, uh, preview or forward. Uh, the question is that uh, today we are going to discuss uh, uh, combating cyber threats in Metaverse as well. So it seems that uh, the Metaverse likely exacerbates the problem of identity theft of avatars, frauds and uh, blackmail, especially with the development of deepfakes uh, that are also becoming a part of this problem. Deepfakes can damage trust in the justice, and uh, because of that, uh, evidence in court can be manipulated, and so on, so on. Moreover, they pose a serious threat to data security and can be easily used by identity thieves. Uh, as uh, far as we know, Metaverse uh, looks like a paradise for different cyber criminals and uh, the ideal breeding ground for the rise of almighty tech and financial corporations. So how to protect the privacy and data uh, for ordinary users in this uh, situation, please? Yeah, no, it works. Okay, it works. Uh, okay, first of all, thank you, Varim, for the introduction. You know, it's really inter interesting topic. I'm Milos Ivanovic. I came from Belgrade, Serbia. My background is related to information security and information technology uh, at all. Uh, when we speak about such emerging technologies like metaverse and concepts generally, uh, we should understand what is in background, you know, we should understand technologies behind, you know, uh, starting uh, from augmented reality and, you know, virtual reality and some concepts related to, to this, we should understand how we uh, want to use, you know, metaverse, for what we want to use. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, speaking about DLT as decentralized database managed systems and so on and so on, we should firstly understand, you know, all, uh, you know, technologies we want to use uh, there. So uh, uh, regarding metaverse and, and, you know, data security, if, if you speak about technology, you know, and metaverse, uh, we should understand that this is, you know, uh, 3D space and uh, we should uh, care about uh, how we want to use technology at all for human, for humanity or for something where we'll make parallel, you know, worlds at all. So uh, regarding data security, uh, there are many confusions right now. We speak about some augmented reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, blockchains and, and et cetera, et cetera. Many people do not understand, you know, uh, for what we want to use it. Uh, we speak, uh, I will start defining, you know, artificial intelligence is one, you know, em emerging uh, concept and so on. So when we speak about, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, who, who will say to you what is exactly artificial intelligence? We should understand that concepts behind artificial intelligence is related to data mining, to algorithms, to crypto mechanisms and so on and so on. So moving further, you know, to uh, quantum cryptography and so on and so on. So uh, speaking about metaverse, we should understand understand that metaverse is based on you know combining many technologies which is are you know which are available uh, you know currently we use every day for example you know uh, 3d technologies virtual reality augmented reality artificial intelligence machine learning behind the you know data mining and many other aspects so m m moving to your question regarding uh, you know security and so on so we should understand basic principles you know behind you know uh, cryptology some you know uh, mathematics models and how we want to protect you know information flow and you know channels speaking about uh, you know uh, networks and generally because metaverse it's you know uh, some uh, concept of virtuality and so on but it's all going through network you know so we should understand how we protect networks uh, you know and our information channels so this is my point if you speak about some you know uh, concept like metaverse we should understand that in background we have many technologies but you know basic phenomena Fundamental principles are the same. Speaking about any technologies, you know, you know, in, in information technology and as a field. So, if we want to go, you know, uh, further in, you know, deeper in information security and so on, there are many uh, different aspects and how we want to protect our, you know, data. Speaking about databases, about uh, you know, uh, information channels and information flow from clients to server side and vice versa and so on. So th this is really wide topics. Uh, I, I will stop here. Because, uh, firstly, I think we should understand for uh, which usage we will use metaverse. And, you know, we have now confusion, as I mentioned before, you know, uh, speaking about blockchain technology, which is, you know, really good technology. And we can use blockchain, you know, to advance our security systems and so on and so on. But, you know, making confusion with cryptocurrencies and, and all other, this is, you know, really, you know, tricky. And it's, you know, I, I will not go to a deeper explanation right now, but we should understand that there are technologies which are you know really uh, you know uh, safe and which are you know uh, which we can use every day to improve our technological systems in you know uh, in everyday life in, in in industry and so on and so and you should understand that we have some risky technologies like I see cryptocurrencies and I, I would say I would conclude that metaverse for me is also something very very risky and uh, you know undefined so thank you very much uh, thank you very much, Milos. It's uh, really a very valuable contribution into our discussion. Uh, Milos is a real uh, expert in uh, cybersecurity field, so I completely trust you. And uh, of course, uh, metaverse is a is a risky a risky area, a risky field. All right. Uh, do we have uh, our online participators uh, speakers? Uh, Alona, are you with us? I am with you, but do you hear me? <laughs> A wonderful, wonderful welcome. Yes, <laughs> so, it works. Uh, my question uh, to you was, um, I, I was talking about uh, the metaverse uh, as a step towards the digital state and corresponding citizenship and uh, laws in the metaverse, how are they going to work? And the question was, uh, in which jurisdiction do you think uh, this metaverse should operate? And uh, what is your opinion? about uh, metaverse rules as such thank you the floor is yours 
Yes, thank you. Well, uh, I would like to refer to what Milos just started to uh, talk about. What is actually metaverse? So when we talk about metaverse, uh, it's quite different uh, substance for everybody. For some people, it's the VR space where you can integrate and co-integrate with each other. For some people, it also involves certain cryptocurrency or blockchain technology. And it's a decentralized space. So it's like a layer X. For some people, uh, it, it's something else. And if we take metaverse in its uh, ultimate concept, let's put it that way, and that's decentralized space where everybody can join and it's certain virtual uh, virtual space where, where, with its own architecture, with its own governance, with its, with its own currencies, with, with its own laws. And uh, it's literally a parallel world where we can participate, where we can be present, independent on where we actually are located or what we actually are doing. And if it comes to that point, and if it's like this one ultimate uh, metaverse, like universe, which is virtual, then uh, in my opinion, uh, governance should be in there. But then it's governance of people. Then it doesn't come towards govern governance from one state because it's not a state of metaverse of, I do not know, like Switzerland, where I'm based, for example, or uh, Dubai, which is super promoting and supporting the whole industry, or Saudi Arabia. It's not states. It's uh, the unification of everybody and everything within one technology. And that's the beauty of it because it gives rights and it gives choices to people. And uh, with exactly with the blockchain technology and cybersecurity, which, which Milos uh, just uh, mentioned as well, it can become safe and it can give certain freedoms and it can give choices to people. And, but then the governance comes towards decentralized governance. And what is decentralized governance and can, how can it work uh, outside of classical uh, institutions? That's, that's quite a challenging question, but I think it's very much within the UN scope of work generally, because United Nations, they unite nations, right? Uh, without uh, looking at who is based where, what kind of jurisdictions people are under. We are talking about human rights and what are human rights? What do people want? So in my opinion, when it comes to governance and metaverse, the ultimate concept comes towards decentralized governance. And uh, it is challenging because it completely uh, goes against what we are used to. It goes against to governance deciding the gov governments of one country being different from another. It comes towards people and communities and how they understand each other, how they understand technologies and how they respect uh, choices. So then democracy comes uh, in quite different lights, I would say. Um, so if you talk about metaverse, uh, then that can be an option. But if we come back to the reality and what we have right now, it's a very, very beginning of this whole huge journey. Then, uh, yes, then if government, government of one country or another supports the metaverse and wants to create certain space where the rules and regulations are applicable from that country, then, of course, uh, it would be great. It would be great that uh, to have there the local currency. It would be great there to have local set of rules. Uh, but then everybody who is participating needs to go through the KYC uh, procedure and every kind of transaction should go through AMA procedure. And literally everything becomes um, a copy, a virtual copy of what we have right now in the centralized and governed world. So we have options, but um, I think that uh, one step after another, technologies can prove uh, that it can serve all the people and it can bring really prosperity to, to the world and uh, give uh, those rights and freedoms that we all dream about for the whole world. Thank you very much, Alona. That was... Uh really an exciting insight and uh, indeed uh, the united nations is about uniting people and countries uh, you're absolutely right that we are at the beginning of the way of the journey as you said but uh, i suppose that uh, we are already uh, in the reality of metaverse it's it's already today's reality not uh, the reality of the future and a part of the 
law, health is uh, what people are interested uh, in uh, while um, uh, talking about metaverse. Uh, crimes related to health are not what is usually discussed when uh, people discuss metaverses. But uh, let's imagine that uh, in, in the virtual world there is uh, some uh, crime which uh, really uh, harms uh, real people. For example, uh, if a cyber attack makes uh, a real person suffer, for example, blind or deaf uh, because of the damage to sound or visual effect while using uh, VR tools. So who's going to be responsible in that case? How can we find a real perpetrator if he or she is in a metaverse? Uh, how will... Um, uh, how will we transfer to uh, virtual reality uh, this effect? So it would be interesting to listen to uh, the point of view of uh, one of our speakers uh, who is a real expert in the field of digital health, uh, Mr. Amado. The floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation to, to attend this panel. <clears throat> well, um, Actually, digital health is part of the uh, toolkit which the World Health Organization offers to the different members of the um, WHO General Assembly in order to equip the uh, Millennium Goals. And then, of course, of course, it's a very important resource which should be taken into consideration in order to, to deploy or to implement a successful healthcare system, which here in Africa, by the way, there are a couple of good examples. Um, yes, you were mentioning two very important issues. I mean, uh, certainly if, if, we, if we talk about a technological world, in which the participants really are in touch with different or with different resources, different instruments which they are not used to in the in their regular life. Well, uh, certainly, uh, a specific health pro problems should be addressed: mental health problems, uh, as you already mentioned, visual hearing. Uh, smelling and sleeping and so on. There, there are uh, very many different issues which, uh, of course, uh, there are a, a lot of studies uh, already uh, published, scientifically um, published, and uh, they show how uh, the effects during the lockdown uh, in, in mental health, uh, which the effects were from not only uh, metaverse, but also from uh, video games or uh, also the uh, uh, exposure to timeless uh, days of uh, uh, television or, or whatever. Then certainly there is a public health uh, issue which we have to address, and, and we, we, we do have to take it into account. But into consideration. But um, the the second area which I think it's important here to address is how the metaverse is going to change the healthcare providing services. I mean, right now um, there are different countries. Uh, for example, if you if you use the NHS uh, services in England, then you you are usually exposed first of all to a robot. Uh, trying to um, fill out a checking, a, a, a check symptom, a, a symptom checker format in, in where they try to make kind of a something that we call in the healthcare a triage, uh, which actually classifies the problem, the health uh, problem of the patient or of the user. And then this robot can provide some guidelines just follow up the guidance, and, and it identifies itself as a robot, of course. And if it is the case, then uh, they bring the patient to 
to a real physician. It, it could be an MP, it could be a specialist, and, and then uh, he could attend. But now, if the metaverse arrives, then you have the possibility to, to get in contact with the patient without changing the, your, the place where you are because sensors will allow patients to have the consultation as, a, as a, if they were at, at the uh, physician's office, offices. Then uh, that, that's going to that's gonna shift the way how we provide services because it is not going to be necessary for every single case to have a, a, speci a, a specific physician, but nurses will play a, a very major role in these cases and, and they will certainly take over some of the activities that we are nowadays used to, to have from, the, from them. Another area which is not exactly, it's not exactly metaverse, but it, it is uh, some kind of approach, is the remote surgery in robot, uh, remote surgery uh, Undergo, undergo by by robots, in which they can, through different uh, sources of information, uh, undergo a an operation which can be controlled by a physician, and it has not to be physically uh, underwent. And this is something that is going to be certainly more frequent, more common, uh, cheaper nowadays. It's very cheap to buy. Uh, one of those um, devices, and uh, not uh, not every uh, every institution can afford, but it will come. And then that means the the uh, the, the new format in, in which the physician will interact with patients at the home care facilities, at the nursery uh, nursing facilities, or at remote places, it's going to be certainly virtual. It is going to be part of the uh, regular uh, healthcare system. And uh, maybe I can uh, finalize my intervention by saying also there is also a very new area, well, not very new, but uh, right now it's really in a, a, in a very uh, high point of developing development is the the self management of care where it is not only about having sensors it is not about only about an electronic health uh, agenda to agenda to to have some uh, in recommendations based on international guidelines but also <laughs> also how the patients interact with the with this huge database which will provide uh, information from different sources. It can include genome databases or gene databases uh, coming up from uh, uh, different institutions, which are, are, they are already public. Uh, some um, different sources from uh, something which is called proteinomics uh, uh, in, uh, in, in and other areas of uh, nutrition uh, health uh, inputs, which will also dramatically change the way how the patient perceives, the way how he can be uh, a partner of the healthcare um, environment which he has to, to follow up. Then uh, there are very promising um, opportunities by using Meta Metaverse. It's not all about, only about NFTs or a, a fancy games or uh, fashions, uh, a, a, a fashion shows, but it, it is also for real practice, real life nowadays that uh, healthcare personnel is lacking. Nowadays that we have a, overbooked the, our institutions and we, the, the resources are not enough, certainly it's going to be a, a, a dramatic sh a shift in, the, in our paradigm, uh, how healthcare should be provided. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amara. So what, uh, from uh, what I understand, it is uh, that uh, metaverse uh, for the digital health from the point of view of health itself is uh, more good than harm right exactly exactly uh, uh, the perception from our side 
uh, looking forward, the, this digital transformation of the healthcare sector uh, is taking into consideration or is including already all the resources which can be found at this new, very, very new environment, which is called nowadays metaverse, but it is going to be part of our current reality. It's not going to be a, a virtual or a different, but it's going to be part of our reality. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. And as we are talking about health issues, uh, let's move to another related topic. Uh, metaverses uh, give the opportunity for disabled people. And uh, VR technology can help, for example, uh, with medical treatment or create uh, a space where everyone uh, can be equal, uh, no matter what one's uh, health condition is. So how can we make this virtual space inclusive for all people? as VR tools are not always uh, designed for people with disabilities. I'm happy to give the floor to our next speaker, Mary Lou uh, Kunanan from the Philippines. Uh, are you with us? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yes, I can see you, and I can hear you very well. Thank you for joining us at uh, this late hour. We really appreciate it. And by the way, according to a recent Deloitte report, the Philippines is a key source of talent for metaverse support uh, as a leading destination for business process outsourcing. That was a quote. So the floor is yours, please. Yes, yes. It's uh, actually one of the things I would like to talk about, um, aside from uh, helping people, how metaverse is able to help people with disabilities. So just to give you a brief background about myself. So I'm... Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, my background is in cultural diplomacy for almost 15 years based in North America, and I'm currently a faculty at Ateneo University teaching international business, and I'm also the CEO of Suyamano, which is an educational, virtual educational platform born during out of COVID. So Philippines is poised to be one of the uh, largest economies in 2030. We approximately have about 110 million in population, and 65% of that 110 million people are under the age of 35 years old, which means a lot of the people in the Philippines, the Filipinos, they're used to being online and they're used to navigating the complexities of internet technology and metaverse. Um, like you said earlier, we are one of the biggest um, pool of metaverse talents. We are the second, Manila is the second um, largest BPO uh, outsourcing company uh, uh, concentration in the entire world. And our second biggest city is the eighth largest. So if you can imagine just a huge number of international companies moving to outsource talents uh, to Philippines. Which brings about because the industry is changing dramatically because of the demand, the education system is also uh, changing dramatic dramatically as well. So recently, Ateneo joined um, this program called X Culture, and X Culture allows almost ten thousand students from almost two hundred universities from. Uh, more than 50 countries to get together and and have classes from different parts of the world discussing companies so this is on international business so discussing companies and case studies um, of, of companies from different parts of the world so this is quite re revolutionary because the traditional classroom so even before uh, even during COVID you have the hybrid online and face-to-face -face classes, but this one is re revolutionary in a way that now your classmates are actually from an entirely different university, studying an entirely different field uh, from an entirely different country. And I think that be because of that um, background and upbringing, this brings about a lot of future changes um, on the way we do business here in the Philippines. Um, the Philippines, aside from being poised to be one of the largest economies in the entire world, the entire Southeast Asian um, countries are also poised to uh, be extremely progressive in terms of technology and 
um, economic aspect as well. So the 10 Southeast Asian countries, the approximately have about 850 million, uh, 850 million population. And 70% of that population is also very young, which is under the age of 35. Vietnam is placing themselves to be the artificial hub um, of Asia by 2030. And Singapore is also uh, investing a lot of funds when it comes to artificial technology um, and metaverse um, and metaverse as well. So when it comes to um, disability, Philippines is able to come up with, we have this organization called Consulta MD, which gathers a lot of different medical professionals to be accessible by different, uh, different Filipinos from different parts of the world. So if you do not know, one out of four nurses um, in other countries most likely are from the Philippines. Just because our healthcare professionals are, we export, we're one of the biggest exporters uh, of talents in the entire world and professional uh, medical people are one of our biggest exports. So now, uh, like one of our speakers have, have mentioned, we have uh, doctors, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists who are now conducting um, uh, sessions, um, consultations, giving medical advices to people without access, um, who, would, who wouldn't normally have access. So it's still quite limited at this time, but I think the metaverse is able to um, be a, a good equalizer, especially for those people with disabilities and who wouldn't um, have access, especially to education and to, to, to um, medical help. Thank you very much, Mary Lou, for this uh, very interesting statistics about uh, uh, the Asia Pacific uh, region and uh, your country in particular, and for um, this uh, very interesting um, uh, perspective. Uh, indeed, uh, I, nev I never knew that uh, one of four nurses in the world is uh, from Philippines. That's great. Thank you so much, and once again, thanks for joining us at uh, such a late hour. <coughs> Well, uh, uh, we are discussing today metaverse. Uh, sometimes thinking that uh, it is uh, it is given, but for many people in the world, especially in the global south, uh, all those equipment, uh, gadgets, and uh, tools are still not affordable. Uh, moreover, global south is still facing connectivity problems and uh, many speakers have been raising this issue uh, since the very beginning of the IGF and uh, not only these days. Is the problem of emerging regulation of advanced technologies relevant for the global south? How can we make sure that the community uh, will uh, hear the voice of the global south while making decisions on regulations of new technology? These questions I would, I would like to ask uh, to our next speaker. Uh, Yumbarana, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vadim, for giving me the floor. Um, to be honest with you, Metaverse is still not really um, very developed in Global South, particularly in my country, Madagascar. Uh, some countries in the Global South may have uh, more uh, uh, develop, developed in Metaverse, but it's not the case for my country. We must understand that the uh, legal framework is still uh, uh, in phase of discussion for most of the countries in the Global South. Um, it remains confusing and unknown to, uh, to many of us, but it brings now a legal, uh, new legal issues and challenges that has been never been before contemplated. And uh, so it's, it's important for us to know what laws will apply to metaverse. It's important to start like in a discussion like uh, in the discussion like we have now at the IGF it's important to start and take learnings from other countries who have already started to use the opportunity provided by the metaverse how can we enact law to be able to benefit 
uh, the metaverse, like using virtual classrooms for education, which is still problematic for Global South, as you may have seen in the television that uh, even classroom is a problematic in Global South. We don't have a classroom for children. For health, uh, for health, it's exactly the same. So, you, um, existing laws may have uh, insufficient to address problematic conduct, but it may uh, trigger passages of the new laws and regulation adopted to Global South reality. And uh, Global South should explore the, the opportunity provided by the metaverse for development of the country. The reg uh, for that, we need to have uh, capacity building for the decision makers, for the policy makers, and uh, for the parliaments to, to, to be able to have uh, a global perspective and to, to have the opportunity to, to be heard and to be and to be shared for the learning of, to share and to take learnings from the other countries. I'll stop here, Vadim. Thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Yombanana. It's uh, really useful for all of us to hear the perspectives of the Global South representative, taking into account that uh, our forum today uh, takes place in Africa, in Ethiopia, and uh, I would like to thank the organizers and this uh, hospitable country for this uh, real uh, festival of uh, internet governance. All right, uh, I'd like to ask our online moderator, do we have any questions uh, so far from the online audience? Thank you very much. So far we do not have any questions from the online audiences. All right, thank you so much, David. In that case, I would like to give the floor to all of you, to the audience. Uh, you can ask uh, any questions uh, uh, which are related to our topic today, please. Yes, the lady. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for this great topic and for all the presenters. I am Mude Sheikh from Tunisia. I want to ask about uh, uh, the, what is uh, the security uh, uh, solution towards uh, if uh, we deploy uh, metaverse that's a very good question thank you much very much uh, i think uh, Miloš, it is yours okay thank you very much for for this question and i will give you know uh, elaboration of, of the situation so we speak about metaverse we know that this is, we saw the first when we saw metaverse it was in futurism you know movies and, and so on and so on so uh, to deploy metaverse you know we should define what is metaverse if this is just a concept of technology which we want to use to help everyday life you know for example colleagues mentioned medicine you know disabled people and so on and so on or it is something where you know uh, far away from our real life so if you speak about metaverse as a concept which will help help, uh, help everyday you know life that's okay and we uh, i will answer this but if you if speak as if we speak about something which is really undefined, which is really, you know, uh, we don't know what is it or just a, co you know, concept, we shouldn't, I don't, I, I, I'm not able to answer this, you, you know, you, th th that's my point on metaverse. So, uh, speaking about digital trans transformation, about emerging technologies, about how we can transform our societies, you know, our countries and so on, this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is, a, you know, place where we can address uh, usage of many emerging technologies like concept like it's metaverse you know like like a metaverse concept so uh you know uh regarding the security issues i will repeat what i said uh if we use technologies in you know in industry in banking sector in the healthcare sector uh, we uh, I, i'm very experienced in health sector healthcare sector because we did the biggest project related to digital transformation in serbia so we know how it is you know uh, how it is important for, for citizens but there there is another question you know uh, people uh, colleagues mentioned here connectivity problems you need infrastructure to deploy uh, technology you know uh, speaking about many uh, countries you know on, on the south we have connectivity 
connectivity problems as well, especially in Africa, Latin America, and so on. So, firstly, to deploy, you know, emerging technologies, to deploy uh, metaverse as a concept, whatever is, is it, you know, we need infrastructure. We need digitalization of, of countries, of governments, you know, of data. There is a big problem how to merge all data in many institutions to make some, you know, records. For example, EHR, EHR electronic health records, for, you, know, you know. There is a lot of question about it. So, speaking only about security concept, you know, uh, it's really hard to describe w what is it in metaverse. I can uh, give you some, you know, uh, uh, comments regarding fundamental principles, how to secure your data using some different algorithms, or for example, Vernum Cheaper, which is, uh, you know, one of the best algorithms we can, we can use to protect our data. This is a very wide topic, uh, but uh, I will conclude that we should think about fundamental principles and how we protect data, because uh, look, look, it's a paradox. Uh, this is an internet governance forum, and we should think about minimum common framework, how we, we will, you know, uh, define uh, internet in, in the future. Will new strategy replace the legacy one? What is the minimum common framework on internet governance? This is a question. So if we ask what is, you know, the minimum common framework on uh, metaverse, how we could, you know, define what is minimum common framework on metaverse if we don't, didn't define what is minimum common framework on internet? You understand? So, metaverse, you know, uh, works via network. That's my point. So, we should understand very clearly which technologies for what we will use. So, thank you. Oh, thanks for the opportunity. I, I think, I think, yes, very, very important issues, very, very important. Uh, I, I think we we really have the opportunity nowadays to to distinguish a little bit between the real and the metaverse world. Uh, the, the, this is something a little bit different. Uh, what I was trying to address were some of the applications that the real world, that means a digital health system, would take from the metaverse. This is, this is an application. This is a way to approach, uh, let's take, for example, the Da Vinci robot that I'm mentioning. Uh, well, it includes, of course, of course, a lot of uh, personal uh, healthcare data, a lot of parameters, uh, images, uh, images, and so on, which should be stored storage in, this, in a place, and certainly it has to be very sure, very, very safe. And for these cases, what we consider nowadays cybersecurity or cybercrime can apply. And we can map a little bit what is going on if, if somebody is trying to steal some information, critical information from the um, documentation department at the hospital, or if, if someone is trying to breach a, a server from the Presbyterian or, for, uh, what, or, or the Minister of Health here in Ethiopia. That, that, that's something that we can nowadays still understand. The point is, if we really approach Metaverse, then we are talking about different rules. It's, it's not that we are going to map the, 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 the way how the society functions nowadays because it is about natural rights or human rights or a common law. This is not, this is not applicable at, at this new environment. This is gonna be a very new world in which we, we do want or we do have to define the new regulations and stuff like that. And it is not only about cybercrime or cybersecurity, it's, it's about uh, how the new concept of property, of privacy, of personality, or whatsoever we are going to have. And, and this will put place a lot of important questions that, that I agree with you. Uh, IGF is a good place to start discussing how are we going to move ahead? Uh, uh, for, for a couple of minutes, a, a conference or, on interplanetary um, uh, communications took place. And it's interesting that right now, for example, in, in, in the healthcare area, we are talking about, uh, 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 about an interplanetary uh, healthcare system. Because someday, 
someday Elon it's going to be able to bring us to Mars and then we have to have a healthcare center there and then okay something is, is going to change you know? and then we 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 do have to to start thinking a little bit different about what's going on and and what can we really do through these kind of participations thank you sorry thank you very much Amada and Milos did they answer your question okay great thank you so we have we have uh, two more questions uh, from the gentleman from the my uh, left please it should sorry got it uh, thanks very much my name is uh, Satish and I'm from India my comment is based on crypto which I've been studying for a while now, by definition, decentralized systems were created specifically not to be governed by states. They are self-governing, and Lawrence Lessig called this code is law, which basically means that all the governance principles are encoded in code, not through traditional documents like charters or constitutions. So code is law, and the, the, the governance is entirely embedded in code. A crypto or a metaverse is a voluntary community, and the governance of such community, in my opinion, is best left to the members of that community and not by the state or another centralized entity who is not part of that community. The community can itself evolve their governance by changing code. Now, I do have concerns on just one or two companies, a few companies monopolizing this space and limiting competition. And what governments can perhaps do is to ensure competition so that these communities govern themselves through competing services. What we could also do is to educate different communities on the risks of participating in these mechanisms. And finally, I do note that this hybrid version of the IGF would have been a much richer experience had it been on a metaverse. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your intervention. Yeah, that's a really interesting point of view. Uh, you had a question, I think. Thank you. Uh, my name is Asim Adil. And I don't have a question, it's actually it's just a reflection of the conversation we had here. As it started about the legal framework, uh, I somehow agree uh, uh, with my uh, colleague here that code can be designed and the people who are participating in that metaverse, uh, they can design their laws itself. But eventually there is someone who has the control on the code and can you address that or not? Then there comes another point of view, that is that, is this a parallel universe, parallel world, or is it also interfering and interacting with the current world? So at that point, when the, it is influencing each of the world, there might be, but definitely there will be a need of such a legal frameworks to interact with that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this valuable opinion. I think it uh, contributes a lot to our today's discussion. Uh, any more questions, please? Uh, okay, madam. Just a comment. Yes. Um, I, I certainly agree a code has to be written, as it was by the uh, French Revolution. I, I don't know if Igualité, Liberté, uh, Fraternity will be the, the basis for the new code at the metaverse. I, I, I'm not sure about that. Uh, I think, yes, uh, we, we do have to, to start thinking about uh, which should be the new roles, which should be guiding the way how we interact there. Uh, I, we, we see the amounts of money already invested into this new environment. Uh, which, if, if the crypto already has some troubles, some, some struggles, uh, I, I can imagine what is going to happen with with the metaverse where no rule actually is in place. Um, from the from from the legal frame, I, I haven't heard anything from the European uh, community uh, starting to define how it is going to work. Of course, in the U.S., uh, we we uh, we haven't heard anything uh, certainly close to that. But it, it's something that it also has to come from the society. I think it's very important that we in the society 
have to define how we do keep the human values, no matter the metaverse uh, deals in another way, and how do we deal with the new sense of uh, interacting in this society through this um, through these platforms, through this new environment, because it's not, not going to be only environment. This, this session, someday, it's going to be in Metaverse. <laughs> and, and we do have to have a, a code still, how we are going to participate, who is going to be allowed, and so on. Today we call it hybrid, but it's going to be someday Metaverse. Then, um, I, I think certainly we, we do have to, to be very thoughtful in this regard. Thank you. Thank you, Amara. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this philosophical question. You know, th this is really important because uh, I have no doubt that there is interference with, you know, real world. You know, we speak about technology, you know, applied technology. So, you know, uh, there is a lot of question regarding, you know, infrastructural side, you know, how metaverse works you know, as a concept, of course, in you know, a basement is technology. You know, uh, yesterday we spoke about internet fragmentation, about some division in our, you know, global space, about technological sovereignty. So if we build uh, one day, you know, I, I agree, maybe we will build metaverse in a way that will be completely, you know, out of our reality, you know, but uh, uh, let's, you know, keep it here, you know, speaking about technological sovereignty, who will control metaverse? Who will control infrastructure? Where the data will be stored? You know, there are a lot of questions. And now we have, you know, internal fragmentation because of many, many uh, things, you know, different aspects and so on and so on. So, you know, uh, I, I don't see, you know, don't understand me wrongly, but I, 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 I think that, you know, this is far away, you know. We should uh, do some, you know, really important task if we want to digitalize our countries first, our continents, you know. Look, you know, what's the situation uh, here in Africa, you know, there are a lot of problems in Europe right now, in Eurasia. We should speak about common standard. For example, regarding data security, data privacy and so on, we have a different standard in the European Union, in the United States. There are, you know, uh, some intentions to build, you know, some standard here in, uh, you know, in Africa. Yesterday I spoke with a colleague from the African Union. Uh, he said that they are trying to make, you know, one uniform approach how to deal with data. And there, there are a lot of questions. For example, when you visit, you know, from the United States, Africa, how they will protect your data? You know, there are a lot of questions, you know. And speaking about cryptocurrencies and so on and so on, we have a lot of different cryptocurrencies, you know, Bitcoins, Ethereum, and etc., etc., etc. Is this just one a supercomputer? For example, if you have, if you, I don't know what's the exact word, but if you try to get Bitcoin or, you know, you, you need your processing power or uh, computer power or wh whatever. If you need another cryptocurrency, you will need, you know, uh, data storage or something like this. If you need another, you will need, you know, uh, CPU or, you know, uh, different type of power. So you just want a supercomputer. You know, we should speak about many different aspects, you know. There are a lot of, you know, un, uh, unclear emerging technologies. People lost money. For example, if you visited the United Kingdom, uh, and then if you go in a train, you know, in a metro, uh, you saw a message, you can see in a message that National Bank cannot guarantee for some cryptocurrencies and so on and so on. We, we saw a situation that China, I think Russia as well, prevented some, uh, you know, transactions with cryptocurrencies and so on. It's all about national sovereignty. You know, we don't live anymore in, you know, a unipolar world. We have a different technological zones. I mentioned it, you know, yesterday. We have Chinese zone, we have Russian zone of technological, you know, influence. We have Western zone of technological influence. So when you visit China, you are not able to use uh, some Western services like Microsoft, like Google and so on. If you visited Russia, you know, you're prevented to use Twitter, LinkedIn, and so on. If you are in the United States or the United Kingdom, there is, you know, debate how, uh, how to use, you know, Huawei equipments or some, you know, equipments from China and so on. There are a lot of fragmentation in every aspect. So I think it's too ambitious to speak about, you know, metaverse and something which is not clearly defined for me, you know. Thank you. Uh, can I ask you a Thanks, question? Thanks, Yeah, sure. Uh, Milos, you uh, touched a very, very important question, and since you are a specialist in uh, cybersecurity, I would like to go deeper on that. So, you said that it's very important, uh, the protection, personal protection and data protection in the online space. 
And I think that's actually the beginning of uh, cybersecurity uh, protection for all the people in metaverse and even before we are in the metaverse uh, right now when it comes to any aspect. So uh, what ways do you see of protection of every individual in the internet space uh, as for now? Because I think that cryptocurrency or let's say cryptography can actually serve quite well on that uh, from the digital identity verification and uh, unique uh, stamps like through NFTs or through any kind of uh, technologies connected to that. What do you think? No, uh, one minute, please. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll be very short because we are out of time, you know. Uh, I agree on some, you know, circumstances, but definitely we should understand basic principles. I did my PhD related to information security, and we learned what is real, you know, what, what is the, the only way how to protect your data. So, uh, if you speak about security, we should know that there is no absolute security. We have many algorithms, you know, ISDS and so on and so on. We use some commercial available algorithms, but uh, security is always about, you know, national security. Security, technology, sovereignty and technology security in the field of technology is a part of national security. So speaking about, you know, how to protect data, I know that in Russia you have your, your you know, law which, pro pro you know, protects data of Russian citizens. Uh, in, uh, the, all data should be stored in Russia. There are many different, uh, you know, uh, laws in the United States, in, in Europe as well. So we should be very careful when we speak about technological aspects. I know your, uh, your intention probably was related to blockchain, and I, I absolutely agree with, uh, with this. This is a good technology can help us a lot to, regarding uh, crypto, you know, and, and uh, you know, how to uh, protect our data, but it's very complex topic. So I mentioned uh, one algorithm, I mentioned different, but it's only, uh, it's all at operational level. So strategically, we should speak about common framework, uh, which will be globally available and how we, we can be sure that all our data, wherever we travel, will, will be safe and secured. Thank you very much, Miloš. Uh, as uh, we are really running out of time, uh, but we started a little bit uh, later, I'd like to ask uh, each uh, speaker, uh, maybe someone has uh, final remarks, just, oh, we have a question, the last one, please. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you very much for this opportunity. I just heard the, the uh, question about um, uh, cryptocurrency and um, a blockchain and NFC. Uh, I don't think there is a total security on uh, a data breach or uh, if anyone here can answer for me, if you, we develop a very sophisticated system for blocking cyber attack, it's not going to happen. The cyber attack is in the human mind. If we build a sophisticated, we invest everything and then do sophisticated uh, to uh, tackle dark wave or uh, other attackers, it's actually in the human mind. It, that sophisticated, the end of the day, the so sophisticated software, whatever hardware, is operating by the human. If that particular employees or managers or directors pass the keyword or the password of the software, that's the end of it. So what we try to do here is actually to avoid a cyber attack. Every one of us has to have responsible, accountable, and also a stable, world internet inclusiveness. How? It has to be effective, accurate, timely measured, and also beneficiary. Not the developed countries developing all this sophisticated um, technology and the third world country's government doesn't have any capability or uh, a building human uh, resources to tackle uh, the cyber attack. The end of the day, and this morning I ask the United Nations, we have to conclude with United Nations governance law. 
That's the only way we can protect everything. Otherwise, uh, the country, they don't have capabilities. They, ca they can get attacked every single day because there is right. employee uh, oh. they have equipped with low professionalism. So at the end of the day, we need to live in this world with the peace, the stability. So, we have uh, sorry, excuse me. I'm finished now, sorry. And what was the question? Uh, I'll talk about the blockchain if you want. Uh, the, I just add with the I'm sorry, we're really so around, uh, right out of time. Uh, actually, we can talk about metaverse and uh, blockchain and DLT uh, cryptocurrencies for hours and hours. And uh, uh, your, well, your opinion is really, really interesting about the uh, global UN law and probably um, about the internet governance. Uh, probably uh, the global digital compact uh, that uh, all the stakeholders are working on now, probably this document uh, will set some rules that will help us and uh, well we have to wrap up and uh, I would like to uh, just to say a couple of uh, uh, things definitely metaverse is something uh, is not something from the future it is uh, today's reality a rather controversial one and yes there should be some rules rules that would ensure our uh, activities in the metaverse are safe uh, secure and beneficial uh, for everyone so that the letter of law is not blurring but a clear one and I hope that uh, our today's visionary ideas uh, will become a part of the global digital compact that uh, I just mentioned um, because uh, they really are useful and uh, practical all right so with this, I would like to thank everyone, first uh, of all our speakers, uh, both on-site and online, and all those who participated in this um, very exciting discussion. Thank you very much.